It's a privilege to be here at this great university and to have the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I pray for the Spirit of the Lord to be with me. It's always a joy to be on this beautiful campus. Your enthusiasm is contagious, and I come away from my visits to Brigham Young University with renewed energy and confidence in the youth of our divine church. I bring you the greetings and love of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. As you face the challenges of a new year, please know that our thoughts and prayers are with you. We pray often that our Heavenly Father will bless you in your studies and in your efforts to be true to the covenants that you have made with Him. I add my congratulations to Coach Lavelle Edwards, to his assistant coaches, and to the entire Cougar football team for that thrilling Cotton Bowl victory and championship of the WAC. The media refers to Coach Edwards as the face of stone, heart of gold, and under his picture is read, profile of a winner. Coach Edwards, thanks to you and to all the players for a great season and a special thanks for representing the church and this university so well while basking in the national spotlight. You've given us much to be proud of and plenty to rise and shout about. I pay tribute to your university president, Merrill J. Bateman, for his great leadership in guiding the destiny of this institution. I know he is a true servant of the Lord, and his only goal for this university is to make sure that the testimonies of the truth of the gospel will burn brighter in each of your hearts when you graduate than it did when you first came here as freshmen. I know of President Bateman's outstanding testimony, courage, and ability. I had the privilege of being assigned with him to reorganize a stake in Arkansas. It wasn't until Sunday morning that he said he hadn't slept for two nights because of a shoulder injury that occurred before leaving on the conference. Instead of letting the brethren know of his disability, he accepted the assignment and endured the pain. His heart is similar to Nathaniel of old, of whom the Savior said, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. One of the major messages of our Lord and Savior was to be righteous within our hearts. I'd like to say that Sister Worthlin and I have had a thrilling experience this last weekend in Salzburg, Austria, where we had the privilege of organizing the 22,300 stake of the church. The leadership there is outstanding, men of education, great faith, and a membership that is devoted. And it seems to me as I talked to uh, the brethren that Europe is on the move for increased convert baptisms, retention, and faithfulness of the saints. They've always been faithful, we know that, but Europe is not similar to some areas of the church where growth is rapid. I hope that all of us will be devoted to the kingdom and build it up and keep the commandments. I feel that this, there is a higher law than even the Ten Commandments, which are still in effect. Jesus, who knows with complete clarity and compassion all the diverse ways of sin, spoke with special intensity and passion about the soul-destroying effects of hypocrisy. He despised hypocrites who feign righteousness and make a public display of it, but are in reality shams and frauds. Jesus intoned, you outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The antithesis of hypocrisy is integrity, which in its connotation and wholeness of spirit and completeness of personality, how glorious is integrity. Those who have it display a constancy of character. Their behavior is the same in private as in public. Their goodness is not dependent on whether someone is watching their actions or based on principle, not expediency. Perhaps that is what Jesus had in mind when he said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. A true measure of whether one has integrity, therefore, is provided by an honest answer to the following question. 
Am I righteous when no one is watching? Your answer to that simple inquiry tells us much about your true character. The constancy of character that distinguishes a person from integrity comes only if one's actions are rooted in principles. Face as we are with a reoccurring need to make choices throughout our lives, we must base our decisions on firm and inflexible principles if we are to escape the pollutions of the world. Our behavior, both public and private, does not happen by accident. It is the product of conviction, resolution, and habitual practice. We become what we believe. We practice the principles that are etched upon our souls. When the moment of decision is upon us, we act according to the principles that have become internalized in our hearts and minds. The following news story, which was widely circulated in 1982, provides vivid evidence that when faced with an the unexpected, our actions are dependent on the principles we believe in. Moments after Air Florida's Flight 90 left the runway at Washington's National Airport, it was clear that the Boeing 737 was not going to fly. As it shuddered and stalled, the co-pilot said, we're going down, and the pilot answered grimly, I know it. With a deafening crash, it slammed into the 14th Street Bridge and plunged into the icy waters of the, Poto the Potomac. Witnesses watched in horror as the fuselage, which had broken free of the tail section, rolled gently and sank beneath the surface, its rows of passengers still trapped in their seats. Only the tail remained afloat, with six people clinging to it. One of them was Arlen D. Williams, Jr., a balding, graying, middle-aged bank examiner and father of two, he was on his way to a bank investigation in Florida. Although divorced two years previously, he was soon to be remarried and was probably the one with the best chance. For while the others had broken limbs and collapsed lungs, he was relatively free of injury. All he had to do was hang on until help arrived. At 4.20 p.m., 19 minutes after the crash, the rotors of the U.S. Park Police helicopter were heard and thwacking through the cold winter air. Bert Hamilton, who was treading water about 10 feet from the floating tail, took the single lifeline dangling beneath the chopper and passed it under his arms. The others watched while the helicopter carried him 100 yards to the Virginia shore and returned. This time, Arlen Williams caught the line. Instead of wrapping around himself, however, he passed it to flight attendant Kelly Duncan. Soon she too was safe. On his third trip back to the wreckage, the helicopter trailed two lifelines, for its crew knew that survival in the river was now only a matter of minutes. One of the lines was aimed at Williams. He caught it again and again passed it on, this time to Joe Stiley, the most severely injured survivor. Stiley slipped the, the line around his waist and grabbed Priscilla Torado who, having lost her husband and baby, was in complete hysteria. Patricia Felch took the second line, and the helicopter pulled away. Before it reached the shore, however, Priscilla Torado lost her grip and fell back into the water, so the helicopter on its next trip had returned for her. Arlen Williams' turn came at last. The chopper crew was eager to meet him and salute his selfless her heroism. But as they approached the wreckage, they saw that he was gone. He had been in the war paralyzing cold for 29 minutes, a minute or so too long. Rescue officer Gene Winder wept as he related the incident to his wife. He could have gone on the first trip, said the pilot, Donald Usher, but he put everything and everyone else ahead of himself, everyone. The virtue of a life based on sound principles is shown in the story of Cory ten Boom, a devout Dutch Christian who was imprisoned in the infamous women's concentration camp at Ravensbrück during World War II because of her Christ-like service in providing refuge to Jews and others. Cory's beloved sister, Betsy, was imprisoned with her. While in Ravensbrück, the two sisters held a nightly worship service at which they read from the Bible Cory had smuggled by the sadistic guards. They read first in Dutch and then translated aloud in German. And then said Corey, 
we would hear the life-giving words pass back along the aisles in French, Polish, Russian, Czech, back to Dutch. They were a little previous of heaven, uh, previews of heaven, these evenings beneath the light bulb. And I would know again that in darkness God's truth shines most clear. Nearly a hundred thousand other poor souls also knew that in darkness God's light shines most clear. Betsy died, the victim of starvation, abuse, and disease. Corey miraculously survived. Though a clerical error, her papers were stamped entholosan or released. A week later, all women her age were taken to the gas chambers. After the war was over, Carrie spoke often about the, her horrifying experiences. On what such occasion, at a church service in Munich, she saw one of the former tormentors, the former Nazi who had stood guard at the shower room door in the prisoner processing center at Ravenbrook. Corey wrote, and suddenly it was all there, the room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain-blanched face, the former guard came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said, to think that as you say, he, Christ, has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I who had preached so often in the, to the people in Bloomingdale the need to forgive kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness, that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with a command, the love itself, close quote. The principles by which all true Latter-day Saints live are embodied in the covenants they make with God. These include covenants referred to by Alma the elder as he baptized in the waters of Mormon. As ye are desirous to come into the fold of God and to be called his people and are willing to bear one another's burdens that they may be light, Yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn. Yea, and to comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to stand as witnesses of God at all times, and in all things, and at all places, that you may be in even until death. You will have noted, no doubt, that these covenants relate to your relationships with other people. King Benjamin, in his great valedictory address to his people, aroused them to an exalted understanding of their relationship to God. They cried, as it were, with one voice, saying, We believe all the words which thou hast spoken unto us, and also we know of their surety and truth because of the Spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us or in our hearts, that we may have no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually. And are we willing to enter into a covenant with our God to do his will and to be obedient to his commandments in all things that he shall command us all the remainder of our life? Close quote. These covenants relate to our relationship with God. We see that we make two different types of covenants with God. One type is highly personal, reflecting our relationship only with him. The other type relates to our relationship with other people. Of course, both types are intertwined and inter interconnected. They cannot be separated. As we learn wisdom, we come to understand that when you're in the ser service of your fellow beings, you're only in the service of your God. Before we discuss the implications of these covenants in our everyday lives, 
I mention another covenant commandment God has given to his children. I mention it because it is increasingly honored more in the breach than in the observation in this and many other lands. The commandment to which I refer is found in what has come to be known as the law of the church. Thou shalt love thy wife with thy heart and shalt cleave unto her and none else. And he that looketh upon a woman to lust after her shall deny the faith and shall not have the spirit. And if he repents not, he shall be cast out. Close quote. Though written in terms of men, this commandment applies equally, of course, to women as well. But some of you may say, that commandment to love thy wife or, or husband with all thy heart speaks to those who are married and not, and I am not. May I simply suggest that each of us ought to be true to our covenant, covenants, to our future, and be true to our eternal partner, even if we have not found him or her yet. The importance of keeping oneself clean, pure, and worthy of an eternal partner cannot be overemphasized. Even in the realization, fulfillment of that re relationship lies in the future. I've, I've spoken briefly of the covenants, the most sacred and supernal promises made between God and men, the sublime of which must surely be the temple covenants with the crowning glory of eternal marriage and his promise not only of continuance, but also of eternal increase. If we have internalized these covenants and take them seriously, they ought to be reflected in our lives all the time, in all places, and in all things that is in our homes, in our business dealings, in the workplace, at school, and in our dating. They are not to be more than words, more than a formality. They ought to be more than just in our minds or written on, on a page. They should be engraved on our hearts. In fact, the Lord said to apostate ancient Israel, the days come when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people, close quote. What is meant by having the laws of God written in our hearts? References to hearts have to do with desires, longing, yearning, what the most inner self really wants. The natural man within us craves the things of the world. To have the law of God written in our hearts, we must undergo a change of heart. We must be changed with our carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness. We must be born again or born of God or born of the Spirit as were Alma and the, el the elder and the people to whom he preached. Alma the younger and King Lamoni and his servants. Hosts of others had their disposition to do evil replaced by a strong desire to do good continually. That made them firm and steadfast in faith to such changed hearts, keeping the commandments of God, including the sacred covenants we have made a baptism and at the altars of the temple is not burdensome or bothersome because then we love righteousness and want to do the will of God. If we live the law of God, Satan will not be able to tempt us as easily as if we break the laws of God. Ask yourself, if my heart has not been so changed, where do I start? How can I make such a change in my own life? Alma wrote that it all begins with with even a desire to believe, voluntary humility, and a willingness to try and experiment with the Word of God. He wrote that we can plant a seed and then nourish it with patience and obedience. Nephi affirmed that this change requires full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent. Samuel the Lamanite testified that the process can begin by believing the Holy Scriptures and the prophets, which leadeth them to faith on the Lord and unto repentance, which faith and repentance bringeth a change of heart unto them. Will hearts once changed always remain changed? Not necessarily. Alma, after preaching, being spiritually born of God and having his image in our countenance, asked his fellow disciples of the Christ and Zarahemla. And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if ye have experienced a change of heart, and if ye have felt to sing 
a song of redeeming love, I would ask, can you feel so now? Alma seemed to acknowledge that the change of heart, the desire for righteousness, can be lost. It can be lost when our lives are out of harmony with the teachings of our Lord and Savior. When we offer the Spirit through being disobedience, when we offend the Spirit, or even being, cast, uh, being casual about our covenants, our desires for righteousness wane and we drift away from righteousness. For those whose hearts truly have been changed, the Lord promised, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. President Brigham Young commented on this principle. He said, they who try to serve God and still cling to the spirit of the world have got on two yokes, the yoke of Jesus and the yoke of the devil, and they will have plenty to do. They will have a warfare inside and outside, and the labor will be very galling, for they are directly in opposition one to the, to the other. Cast off the yoke of the enemy and put on the yoke of Christ and you will say that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. This I know by experience, close quote. Must we take a very long time to come to love the truth and want to keep the commandments? We always must remember that eternity is now, that is part of now, and not some abstract time we look forward to in some far distant future. You and I are living this very moment in an important part of eternity. If we understand this truth, we will find it easier to make wise decisions in many choices placed before us each day. We will be less likely to clutter our lives with trivial, time-consuming dead ends that are unimportant in the eternal perspective. Yes, brothers and sisters, we are living in one of the most critical parts of all eternity because we are living in the day of our mortal probation. Concerning mortality, the Lord said, we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. We read in the Book of Mormon that this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. The question we might pose to ourselves are, do I merit the blessings of eternity with the life I'm presently living? Or, how am I spending eternity now? If we make every earthly decision with eternity in mind, we shall have used our mortal probation wisely. At the tender age of 18, President J. Reuben Clark wrote these words, self-control is something that we should all cultivate, for upon exercise of our mind over our bodies, which constitutes self-control, depends our future prosperity and usefulness in this world and our salvation in the next. Shakespeare tells us that our bodies are our gardens to which our wills are gardeners. We can so control our minds that it will make us Christ-like human beings. If we firmly resolve to do anything, we generally accomplish it. If we resolve in our minds that we will make our, of ourselves good, honorable, honest, virtuous, and industrious men and women, and keep this resolve firmly rooted in our minds, we will surely become that kind of a person who is respected by his or her friends, who searches and secures the affection of his family ties and who is loved by his God." Close quote. What we need to do is to commit to become serious about being truly covenant people of the Lord. If we have real intent and are willing to follow, the Holy Ghost will guide us it will guide our lives in sure paths. We will meet the expectations the Lord has for us as his covenant people and will surely receive the promised blessings. May we live out our lives in obedience to sacred covenants. May we be righteous when none save God bears witness of our actions. May we be motivated by principles and not by expedience, having God's laws written in our hearts, his image in our countenances. May virtue garnish our thoughts unceasingly, then shall our confidence wax strong in the presence of God. The Holy Ghost shall be our constant companion and our scepter, an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth. May we remember that today is an important part of eternity and live to be sure that our days of probation will give us peace in this life and eternal life in the world to come. 
Each one of you is a child of God. He loves you and longs for your happiness. During this year, President Gordon B. Hinckley has relentlessly traveled throughout the world, giving 187 talks. In the October 1996 General Conference, the prophet said that he is determined that for as long as he has, has the strength to do so, he will get out and meet the saints, both the youth and the adults. He is, a, he is living these words and those he spoke at his first press conference. After being introduced as our new prophet in March 1995, he said, I will carry on the great work which has been furthered by my predecessors, building family values, fostering education, tolerance, and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We as the First Presidency, he said, are dedicated, as have been those before us, to teaching the gospel of peace, to the promotion of civility and mutual respect among people everywhere, to bearing witness to the living reality of our Lord Jesus Christ and to practice of his teachings in our daily lives. About you, President Hinckley has said, I meet young people everywhere who are wonderful and faithful. They are youth who want to do the right thing and who indicate that reality of what I have been saying for a long time, that we've never had a better generation of young people in the church than we have today. They're faithful, they're, they are active, they're knowledgeable, they are just as great as ever a generation has been. Notwithstanding the environment in which many of them are growing up, certainly this is a great statement for you and me, and especially the youth. I bear testimony that President Gordon B. Hinckley is the Lord's chosen prophet today, and I bear unwavering testimony that our Heavenly Father and His divine Son, Jesus Christ, guide the affairs of this great church. We must all understand that the gospel is everlasting. It is forever and applicable to all, and each of us is to be held accountable. The gospel has been restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. May the Lord bless us to keep his commandments. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.